Well, as you guys can see, we are continuing on in our series through the book of Nehemiah. And, and just a bit of a recap, not just from the first few weeks, but also uh, how we got to this point in history, which is roughly 450 to 500 uh, BC, that is before Christ. And so from time and time again, God's people find themselves in trouble, uh, in the form of slavery or captivity, and God will send a prophet, God will send judges, and God will rescue his people out of their trouble, out of their shame, set them on solid ground, give them his commandments to follow, and they will for a while, and then they don't. And then you just see this pattern of God's people rescued by God, and then disobeying God, winding up in trouble. And from time to time, God will shake his people and get their attention in the forms of judgments. And so where we are now at this point in history, right before the book of Nehemiah and the events that we're going to be looking at, is God's people has, have rebelled against him. And God sends judgment from Babylonia. And the Babylonians sack Jerusalem. They destroy the temple. They destroy the city walls. And everything is left in ruin. And the people of God are taken into Babylonian captivity in exile for 70 years. And then soon after that, the Babylonians are taken over by the Persians. And so this man... Nehemiah finds himself in God's sovereignty as an Israelite exile, a person who's been exiled, never seen his homeland, hears about it as he's a cupbearer at King Artaxerxes' palace. That's where he finds himself. And so Nehemiah hears a report from men who make a journey to Jerusalem, see the destruction, see what's going on, comes back, they come back and he hears their report that the walls are broken down, that the people are in danger on all sides and he's broken. He's torn apart by the news because he has a zeal for his countrymen, for his people. And so he weeps for them. And he prays day and night and night and day. And then in that place, he's emboldened to go before the king with this God-sized dream to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And in that boldness, he goes to the king, risking his life by making this request and says, may I have permission to take leave from working in your palace to go and help restore the city of Jerusalem. And surprisingly, the king says, yes, you can have that. Please go. And and this is where I really love the character of Nehemiah because I'm the baby in in the family, so I tend to push boundaries. So if you're willing to give me this, I'm just going to ask for a little more. And so Nehemiah in his boldness says, all right, king, uh, thank you for letting me take leave. Thank you for letting me go. Um, Do you mind if I put this on your tab? And he says, yes. Like, we're going to need stuff. We're going to need equipment. We're going to need lumber. We're going to need letters of approval so we don't get jacked on the way there. And he says, absolutely, take take what you need. And, And in that, we see how Nehemiah honors even a pagan king. And we can see how we should honor anybody in authority over us. He doesn't try to manipulate the king. He doesn't try to go around the king's back. He doesn't try to pull a a dumb and dumber. Uh, Sebastian said, put it on my tab. For some of you men over 35, you, you get me. No, he honors the king. And the king says yes, because the king's heart is in the hand of a sovereign God who has a sovereign plan. And this leads us to Nehemiah chapter 3. So the, the, Nehemiah takes a team of men, they go, they scope out Jerusalem, they observe everything that needs to take place, they're met with some opposition along the way, they say not today, Satan, and then they strengthen their hands for the work. And that's where we find ourselves right here in the beginning of the construction of the walls of Jerusalem. So if you have your Bibles, uh, please go ahead and turn to Nehemiah chapter 3. The verses will also be uh, behind me. And I'm also going to say this before we read it, uh, that in about three or four verses in, you're probably going to go, huh? Like, are we really reading that here uh, this morning? And, And the answer is yes, because this is God's word. 
And, and so here at C3, we have a high priority. The highest priority is God's word. From Genesis to Revelation, it is all God-inspired. And so while commentaries might skip over this chapter, thinking there's nothing for us there, we believe that God has given us his word so that we might be encouraged in it this morning. And so go ahead, get a stretch in. Uh, maybe take that one last sip of coffee because we're gonna go verse one through 32. We're gonna get through this together. I'm gonna mispronounce some Hebrew names and it's gonna be great uh, because we're doing it all together. Okay, Nehemiah chapter three, verse one. Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hananel. And next to him, the men of Jericho built. And next to them, Zachar, the son of Emri, built. The sons of Hassanah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. And next to them, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, son of Hakaz, repaired. And next to them, Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, son of Meshezabel, repaired. And next to them, Zadok, the son of Bayana, repaired. And next to them, the Tekuites repaired. But their nobles would not stoop to serve their lord. Joida, the son of Pasiah, and Meshulam, the son of Besediah, repaired the gate of Yashana. They laid its beams and set its stores, its bolts and its bars. And next to them repaired Miletia, the Gibeonite, and Jadon, the Maranathite, and the men of Gibeon and of Mizpah, the seat of the governor of the province beyond the river. Next to them Uziel, the son of Hariah, goldsmiths repaired. Next to him Hananiah, one of the perfumers repaired, and they restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Next to them Rephiah, the son of Hur, ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired. Next to them, Jediah, the son of Harumaf, repaired opposite his house. And next to him, Hattush, the son of Hashabaniah, repaired. Malkijah, the son of Haram, and Mashab, the son of Pahath Moab, repaired another section of the Tower of the Ovens. Next to him, Shalem, the son of Halohesh, ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired, he and his daughters. Hanun and the inhabitants of Zenoa repaired the valley gate. They built it and set its doors, its bolts and its bars, and repaired a thousand cubits of the wall as far as the dung gate. Malkijah, the son of Rechab, ruler of the district of Beth Hecarim, repaired the dung gate. He rebuilt it and set its doors, its bolts and its bars. And Shalem, the son of Kol Hoza, Hose, ruler of the district of Mizpah, repaired the fountain gate. He rebuilt it and covered it and set its doors, its bolts and its bars. And he built the wall of the pool of Shelah, of the king's garden, as far of the stairs that go down to the city of David. After him, Nehemiah, the son of Azbuk, ruler of half the district of Beth Zur, repaired to the point opposite the tombs of David, as far as the artificial pool, as far as the house of the mighty men. After him, the Levites repaired, Raham, the son of Bani. Next to him, Hashibiah, ruler of half the district of Keilah, repaired of his district. After him, their brothers repaired, Bavaya, the son of Henadad, ruler of half the district of Keilah. Next to him, Ezer, the son of Jeshua, ruler of Mizpah, repaired another section opposite the accent to the army of the buttress. After him, Barak, the son of Zebiah, repaired another section, repair, uh, sorry, knew this would happen, repaired another section from the buttress to the door of the house of Eliashib, the high priest. After him, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, son of Hakaz, repaired another section from the door of the house of Eliashib to the end of the house of Eliashib. After him, the priests of the men of the surrounding area repaired. After them, Benjamin and Hashab repaired opposite their house. After them, Azariah, the son of Messiah, son of Adoniah, repaired beside his own house. After him, Benuai, the son of Henadad, repaired another section from the house of Azariah to the buttress and to the corner. Palau, the son of Uzziah, repaired opposite the buttress and the tower projecting from the upper house of the king at the court of the guard. After him, Padiah, the son of Parash, and the temple's servants living in Ophel, repaired to a point opposite the water gate on the east and the projecting tower. After him, the Tekoites repaired another section opposite the great projecting tower as far as the wall of Ophel. Above the horse gate, the priests repaired, each one opposite his own house. After them, Zadok, the son of Immer, repaired opposite his own house. After him, Shemaiah, the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate, repaired. 
After him, Hananiah, the son of Shelemiah, and Hun, the sixth son of Zaloth, repaired another section. After him, Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, repaired opposite his chamber. After him, Melchizedek, one of the goldsmiths, repaired as far as the house of the temple servants and of the merchants, opposite the muster gate and to the upper chamber of the corner. And between the upper chamber of the corner and the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants repaired. All right. Praise God. Uh, yeah. Uh, for those of you who dozed off right about Beth Shechem, please uh, rejoin us uh, this morning. If your neighbor's still just kind of dizzy, do- dozing off, give him a, a gentle nudge with your shoulder. Uh, welcome back. I told, I told Seth uh, this week uh, that I noticed that my first sermon ever here a few months ago just happened to be on marriage. Um, and, and I told him, hey, I'm fine giving this charge to the men. Like, let's go. Let's get at it. But this is a sea full of new faces and, and new women. And so week one, introductory week, like women submit to your husbands. I was like, that was a, a daunting task. Um, but I just took it as God's sovereignty, right? Like, that's the way the cookie crumbles. It's the way the dice rolled. Uh, and then I saw my assignment for Nehemiah 3. <laughs> and I started started to scratch my head a bit and, and wonder if I saw a trend uh, developing. Um, I don't know, um, but I, I believe my next assignment might be a genealogy or, a, or spiritual gifts or something like that. So I kid, I kid. Uh, some of you are still wondering, like, are we really here? Did we really just do that? Are we really going to go through this chapter this morning? Uh, so I want to ease you up a bit and say yes. Like, absolutely, we are, uh, but I want to give you some reasons why. And there are a number of reasons, but there's two primary reasons. Because I think as we do some investigative work, this chapter might go from huh to something endearing, something that we're glad for, something that we're thankful for that we see in God's sovereignty was a good thing for us in 2023, 2,500 years later to have before us this morning. And, and the first reason why is, be, is when we look to the New Testament, we have some commentaries on the Old Testament. And one of those comes from uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, where Paul instructs Timothy as an elder, as a pastor, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so when it says all scripture, it means all scripture. It means all of the Old Testament. It means all of Nehemiah. It means all of Nehemiah 3 is God breathed and profitable for us today, for teaching, reproof, correction, for training in righteousness. And you're asking yourself, I don't see how. But think about the patience and long-suffering that you're already having to go through this morning. Mostly with my bad pronunciations. It's God-breathed, inspired. And my favorite in the New Testament, my favorite verse that gives a commentary on the Old Testament is found in Paul's writing to the Romans, chapter 15, verse 4. He says, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Whatever was written. That means all that was written. And it was written for these purposes. One, that you and I might be encouraged. And two, that we might have hope. And so the goal this morning as we look at Nehemiah 3 is to put on our investigative lenses and find out what is God speaking to us as a church today through this word. If his word is living and active, then what are we to take away from this? We've still got some groundwork here. I want to say this, that when we look at the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, in one sense, it it is a human book. Because it was written by human authors. It's telling the story of human history. It's written in a certain human language, in a certain human context, at a certain point in human history. And so it is a human book. But in another sense, simultaneously, the Bible is a divine book. 
we see that the Holy Spirit is giving inspiration to his people to document all the words that are proceeding from the throne of God. And because God is the primary author, what we don't have in the Bible is 66 different stories. We have 66 different books. We have dozens of different authors, most of whom never knew each other, lived at different times. This book, this whole Bible was written over the course of centuries, over a thousand years, over three continents. But still, what we have is one story, not 66 different stories. And so what we must do when we look to Nehemiah 3 is try to understand how it fits in the broader narrative of God's story of redemption, of how God is revealing himself. So if there is a bigger story than what's being looked at here, then what we see when we look to Nehemiah is that Nehemiah was not an ultimate Nehemiah but is pointing to an ultimate Nehemiah. And when we look at this Jerusalem, we look at the city that's being built, what we see is not a forever city, but a city that's pointing to an eternal city, a greater city, the new Jerusalem. And so up until this point, in the last few weeks, this is what we've seen in Nehemiah, who is pointing to the greater Nehemiah, namely Christ. In chapter 1, verse 3, he hears of the Israelites' great trouble and shame in the ruined city, and he's moved with compassion. In the same way that Christ looks at us in our sin and in our shame and is moved with compassion to step into our mess as fallen people. In chapter 1, verse 4, he weeps for Jerusalem. And then in the Gospels, we see Christ weeping for Jerusalem. And he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I've longed to gather you together as a hen gathers her brood. This Nehemiah is pointing to an ultimate Nehemiah. He points to one who was in the palace, in a place of honor, right there with the king, completely safe, and leaves it all, subjecting himself to all forms of danger. Do we see a a bigger picture here? This Nehemiah points to one who identifies with his people as he had a zeal, as he had compassion, as Christ had zeal for the house of God, and it consumed him. This Nehemiah looked upon his people, had compassion because they were a people without a city. But in the Gospels, we see Christ looking about his people and having compassion because they were a sheep. They were sheep without a shepherd. This Nehemiah risked his life, but Jesus did all that he did, not at the risk of his life, but at the cost of his life. It cost him everything. And then lastly, leading into our text, this Nehemiah helped build a physical Jerusalem. But Jesus came to build an ultimate city, an ultimate kingdom, the new heavenly Jerusalem. And so only when we see Nehemiah 3 through this lens and we see it connected in the greater overarching story that God is writing, only then will we see this as a transformative book, as something that is inspired by God and is applicable for me today. Something that can change my broken heart and change the mess around me. And so uh, to start off, why don't we go ahead and look at a map. Sorry, I keep clapping. I'm excited about Nehemiah 3. Um, So why don't we go ahead and start with a map. And also, uh, I got this cool laser. Um, And I may or may have not had a dance party in my living room alone uh, because it's awesome but essentially what we're looking at here and I think this will be helpful I'll stand over here is this is more or less the city and the walls that are being constructed here in Nehemiah 3 some of you are like oh that helps that's a little bit better Um, so uh, about two and a half miles 
wide. So the whole um, circumference, about two and a half miles. So this is a long wall. This is a daunting task that the Israelites are endeavoring on. And so uh, all of these walls are roughly 40 feet high in an age without cranes and machinery, roughly 40 feet high and about six to nine feet in width. It's two and a half miles wide, walls 40 feet high and six to nine feet in width. And so what Nehemiah essentially does here is uh, he starts off by mentioning these 10 gates that are located across here. And we're gonna go through each of these gates briefly. If you wanna go more in depth, there's, uh, there's resources online and, and I would encourage you to do that. Uh, but he starts off right over here at the sheep gate and then he makes his way uh, counterclockwise all the way around. And so when he talks about the sheep gate, uh, a lot of people see these gates as correlating to Christ. And, and, and by no stretch of the imagination, many of them do. And so I love the simplicity of these people of Nehemiah. They see sheep going in and out the gate. They call it a sheep gate. Uh, they see fish at this gate and they call it a, a fish gate. And so uh, the sheep gate is where the sheep would come into the temple for sacrifice. And so one of the ways that correlates to Christ is that Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then next to it over here, uh, we have the fish gate where fishermen would come, they would bring their stock, they would sell, they would trade. And then Christ tells his disciples, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. And then we have uh, the gate of Yeshanah right at about here, which is also called the old gate. And it's called the old gate because it's believed uh, that this gate existed in the city prior to Jerusalem, when it was just Salem. Uh, so it's the old gate, which also can indicate that there is a new gate uh, where Jesus comes in on the scene. And in John 10, 9, he says, I am the gate. Whoever uh, enters through me will be saved. And they will come and go out and find pastures. And so over here, just a little bit further down, we have the valley gate on the west side. And this is the lower part of the city. And some say that correlates to the humility of Christ. It's the lower portion of the wall. And then way over here, we have the next gate on the south side. And this is the dung gate. Yes, I said dung gate. That's what we read. And no, that's not where they had uh, infant ministry. Uh, this is where all of the waste of the city uh, would go through. They would take it out to the valleys over here and they would burn it. They would discard it. So you have uh, the entrails of animals and so on and so forth. And some people viewed the city of Jerusalem to be so holy that they would choose not to do certain things in the city, if you know what I mean. They viewed it so holy that they had a great understanding of where the exits were just in case. And so we see in Philippians, Paul says that all of my righteousness... All of the faith that I had in this physical city, in this physical temple, all of the sacrifices, everything that I believed in then, I count as rubbish now as Christ has come and fulfilled all prophecy. And so this has no place in the new Jerusalem. So that's what he's referring to here. And then next to it over here, uh, we have a couple, uh, a water gate and a fountain gate, which points to Christ. And we can think of the time when he tells the woman at the well, whoever drinks this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst again. And then from him, fountains, springs of living water will come forth. We see how a lot of these gates are pointing to Christ. And then next to it, we have the northeastern side where we'll have the horse gate and the east gate. And so in today, uh, today's age, horses are something that children love. They fall in love with it. What little girl doesn't want a horse? Uh, but back then, horses represented war. And so some believe that the horse gate is pointing to the spiritual warfare that you and I are still in this day. Some believe it also points to the vision that John sees of Christ coming, riding on the clouds of heaven on a white horse and the army of Christ behind him. And then the east gate... Uh, right around this region over here is believed to be the gate that Christ entered on Palm Sunday. And it's believed that because it has the quickest and easiest access into the temple. And this is the temple right here. 
And then lastly, we have the muster gate, which is also referred to as the gate of inspection, where the elders and people of Israel would sit and, and judge um, problems that are happening amongst the people. And it's believed that that points to the judgment seat of Christ. And so these are the gates that we're talking about here. And what Nehemiah does is fill in the gap. So we have a gate, 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 and we have some space in between the gates. And so when he says next to him, next to him, this is what he's talking about. People are building the gates, and then we have people building the wall, and it's going all the way around right there. So boom, got to use my laser, um, and I'm satisfied. So I do uh, have um, a sermon title and some points that I want to get to. I recognize I used about half of my time for introductory matters, but now that we have the stage sort of set, uh, the title of the rest of the sermon is A Marvelous Work. A marvelous work is what we see here in Nehemiah 3. And the first thing that is necessary for a marvelous work is a marvelous unity. And that's what we see. We see that the people here had a marvelous unity about them. And one of the amazing things about the unity that they shared was the diversity that was amongst them. And so here it starts off with clergymen, priests. And you would think, yeah, duh, right? Like this is a religious matter, it's a religious work, so it's right that the clergymen and the priests would be a part of it. And then immediately, we see laity working side by side with the priests. And then we see men and women working together. We see men and their daughters working together. Groups from different towns and different classes, different trades. We have goldsmiths, perfumers, merchants, a diversity of workers. We have a ruling class. We have a working class. Every part of society for the Israelites is essentially represented in this people, recorded in this book. And so what can we take away from that? If this is pointing to something bigger than itself, I would say that it points to the beauty that expands even further in the church age, in the gospel age. We're in Revelation 7, 9. John says, after this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And then Paul says to the Galatians in 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so the unity that we see in Nehemiah 3 is pointing to a greater unity in the future, which is the church, which is you and I here gathered today. But in this, we have a beautiful picture of the oneness, of the spirit of oneness that they shared. I counted 15 times we see the phrase, and next to them, and next to them. So-and-so, so-and-so, and and next to them. So-and-so, so-and-so, and and next to them. They're linked in arms together. And as I started to think about that this week, I started to flesh that out and, and put myself in that picture, I had to ask myself the question, you think they got to know each other? Do you think that proximity for 52 working days and working nights put them in a position to get to know each other well? Or do you think there were plenty of opportunities for them to argue and and to bicker? Because the unity that I'm talking about might sound cute and sweet at first until we put ourselves in that picture. Uh, until we recognize that we can be difficult people to work with and, and consider the conditions that they had. It was dirty, grimy work. They were outside. They were doing hard labor. They were sweating. They were aching, lifting heavy things and hanging gates, bones, muscles fatigued. And so they're hanging all of these things, and I'm thinking, have have any of us, like any marriages, any fights ever break out by simply just hanging a frame 
in your home? Like, like Christmas is around the corner. Has there ever been any arguments about Christmas decorations? And baby, that doesn't look right. Or can you do that a little bit better? And you just kind of get frustrated with each other. Or maybe you've taken on a home project and you go from Chip and Joanna to like Ross and Rachel on a break. Like things just go south bad and miserably. It's hard. It's difficult. I loved young adult ministry uh, when I was in my 20s, not a young adult anymore, sadly, but I loved it when I was in my 20s. And so there's always an opportunity right around this season for camping trips. And, and I love camping trips until we got to make a campfire. And, and the reason why is because every bro who in their 20s turns into Bear grills when it comes to making a campfire. And I'm like, guys, we have enough gasoline and lighter to burn this whole forest up if we wanted to. Like, it doesn't really matter all the tweaking that you're doing. So I'm like, I'm out there. Some of you men know who you are or used to be standing over the grill. You're going to flip that? We can be difficult people. My wife can probably say amen to this. I am a very opinionated man. You think these people didn't suffer with a thousand opinions of what needed to be done? Like one of the first fights we had, the dumbest fights that we had early on in our marriage came from me, was when deep cleaning the kitchen, are we sponge people or are we paper towel people? And the neat freak OCD person that I am doesn't want a sponge hanging around afterwards. So I'm like, let's just use paper towels. I couldn't let it go. All of a sudden, the evening's ruined because I had a dumb opinion and couldn't get past it. Am I the only one here? I think so, maybe. Tough crowd. <laughs> All of these conditions, like we got it made in this air condition right now. Imagine being outside. You know how cranky we get. Getting hungry. You know how difficult it can get. They had all the conditions for disunity. And yet somehow they were unified. Why? How? My answer is they work together for a common goal. The goal was bigger than their own dreams. The goal was bigger than their own aspirations. The goal was bigger than their own preferences. They laid it aside for the work of the kingdom because it was a greater work than building their own. And so the unity that you and I are called to as Christ's church, and this isn't understood enough, is a supernatural unity. Like it's a unity that can't be done in the flesh. It's bigger than you and I loving the Astros. It's bigger than any affinity that we might share. It is supernatural because literally in Christ we are one. One body with one head who is Christ. And our unity, this needs to be understood, our unity in Christ, our unity with each other is not a gospel add-on. It's an essential part of it. In fact, the litmus test for determining in Scripture if we are truly in the faith, if we have a genuine faith, is based on our unity with one another, our love for one another, our eagerness to maintain the unity of the Spirit. These are ways in which we test ourselves to see if we are in Christ. And I was greatly encouraged of hearing about one of my heroes, Martin Lloyd-Jones, and this spiritual battle that he experienced. Martin Lloyd-Jones uh, was a, an Englishman born in 1899, died around 1981, I believe. And this guy was like on the career path to be envied. He was a doctor, he was a prominent doctor, and he was growing and expanding in his role. And as I understand it, he was on his way to becoming a member of the House of Lords which I have no idea what that means, but it sounds awesome. Like, I'm excited if I'm on that list. Don't know why. You know, but that was him. Prominent young doctor, an amazing future in front of him, and then he becomes a Christian. And things change for him. He feels called to the ministry and then eventually takes a pastor position in Wales in a small fisherman village, a poor small fisherman village. And as a young believer in the pastorate, he's battling with some spiritual battle. 
And he says, these are his own words, he says, very often Satan would come and ask, how do you know that you are a Christian? And he wouldn't know how to reply. He was stumped. He said, until one day I turned around and said, I want to know, Satan, why I would rather talk about Jesus with the humblest fisherwoman in Wales. Why would I love doing that more than I love talking about medicine and with my peers and with other men who have gone to the same schools with me and are of the same social class? You see, England at this time was very class diversified. It was that people didn't interact with other classes. It was rare. So essentially what he says is, why would I rather, why would I feel more alive talking with a poor fisherman village about Jesus than talking with men in these ivory towers who have the same background as me, same education as me, same pedigree as me? Why do I feel connected to them in a way I don't feel connected with these people? And the warfare ceased from that time. And so kind of closing this point on, on unity, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've been born again, if you've been washed by the blood of Jesus, then your citizenship is primarily in heaven above. You are seated with Christ in heavenly places, primarily. That is your citizenship. You're a Christian first, and then you're black, white, Hispanic, Latino, Asian afterwards. We are Christians first, even above our last name. We are Christians first, even above our blood that is shared. And so Peter, in 1 Peter 2, 9, says to us, this is for us today, C3. He says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Why? To proclaim the excellencies of Christ. That is our goal. That is our task. That is the church's mandate. And so what this means is that not only are we all one in Christ, but every Christian has a ministry. All of you are ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you have believed in him, every single one of you. Which brings me to my second point. Is that these people, just like us, were called to a marvelous service. And so here in Nehemiah, we see it's all hands on deck. Everybody must play their part. Jerusalem could not be rebuilt the nation state could not be rebuilt. The government could not be reestablished without all hands on deck. It couldn't just be the priests. It couldn't just be the clergymen. It couldn't just be the small group leaders. It needed all hands on deck because the work was so big. And so this is where we find ourselves in the church age. It's all hands on deck. We need each other. There's no unimportant gift in the body of Christ. And so if you've been called to be a part of C3, if God has put you here in his sovereignty, if you've made this your home, then it's not by accident. Like God has gifted you in ways to advance the kingdom through this place. He's given you experiences. He's given you a history and ways that you can relate to people that others can't. And sometimes we want to punt on those responsibility and say, no, well, can this person minister to that person? No, God's put you in front of them. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You've been gifted by God for the work of the ministry. The work that the Israelites had, like I said, was a daunting task. And there's an element in which you can say it was an impossible task. And the reason why I say that is because when we look ahead to chapter 6, when the wall gets completed, the enemies that were taunting them, that were ridiculing them, look at the work that's done in 52 days. 
and they look at it and said, these are just a bunch of nobodies. They're not an impressive people. They're regular Joes like you and I. They could not have done this alone. There must be something bigger happening here. And they conclude with this, their God must be with them. And they fall in fear. And so you and I have what you might call an impossible task. What is our charge and what is our mandate? Go out into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is an impossible task apart from the Holy Spirit. But also apart from all of us playing our role in the body. And so I started, I started thinking about that this week. You see, Christ taking 12, and he sends them out. You know, in, in Nehemiah, I'll backtrack a little bit, in Nehemiah, what even some liberal scholars believe is that this is a transition away from one prominent leader doing all the ministry to the people of God doing the ministry. Even liberal theologians believe that there's a transition happening here. And then 450 years later, we see the age of the church where Christ takes 12 men. He says, you go do the ministry now. I've trained you, I've equipped you, you go. And then he takes 72. I've trained you, I've equipped you, now you go. In Acts, we see 120 people filled with the Spirit, and they go out proclaiming the gospel. And so not to over-spiritualize this, but I'm, I'm thinking here at C3, start fleshing this out in my mind. Hey, if we're about 120 adults, give or take some, right, if we were to dedicate ourselves over the course of the next year to go out and proclaim the excellencies of Christ to one person who doesn't know Christ, if we were to disciple them and by God's grace they come to know the Lord, then in one year, all of us playing our part, we would have 240 believers in Christ in just one year. If we train these disciples to make other disciples, then by year two, we have 480. If we do that again, by year three, we have roughly 900. Year four, roughly 2,000. Year five, we have roughly 4,000 people coming to know the Lord. And that's not for the sake of building the C3 kingdom, in the midst of that, we're, we're planting churches, we're doing other things, we're growing people up in their gifts and utilizing and saying, go. 4,000 people in five years, you and I probably aren't gonna reach 4,000 people in our lifetime. Like, unless you're that five talent person, uh, if God's blessed you with a ministry, maybe if you're the next Billy Graham, uh, but we're likely not. Well, how does five people in the next five years sound? Manageable? Doable? If you go all the way to 10 years, we're at about 122,000 converts. All of us playing our part, taking 10 people. That's more than the population of the Woodlands. In fact, I think that's more than the population of the Woodlands and Magnolia. So the people in Nehemiah had a, had a God-sized vision my question for us this morning, my question for me this morning, this week, is what is the God-sized vision that I'm going after? Like something that cannot be accomplished apart from the Holy Spirit's work in my life. And if it is God-sized, then I will have to keep praying for it, going to God day and night and praying, Lord, you must move. Men, what is a God-sized vision that you have for your marriage? What is the God-sized vision that you have for your family and for your children that you're on your knees praying to the Lord to move? The legacy you want to leave behind. Beyond that, we have, we have needs here, like at C3 Church. We, we have needs for people to have a God-sized vision to, to serve. We have a children's ministry. We need more volunteers. Maybe God's equipped you for that. We need more hands with road crew because many hands makes light work. What are areas and ways you can help play your part here 
at C3 Church. And, and here's another encouragement is that sometimes we can get so hung up on the gifts that we have that we can only serve where that gift fits. And sometimes we get to use those gifts, but sometimes it's good to just examine and say, where's there a need? Like, I'm not a handy guy, man. When I look at this construction taking place in Nehemiah 3, I'm like, dude, I don't know what I would do because I don't have a handy bone in my body. Like when Harvey came through, I was useless, except I knew I could carry some rotten baseboards from here to there, okay? So you other gifted guys, tell me what to do. And sometimes we just need to do that in the body. You might be gifted in that, how can I carry your bags? How can I make your load a little bit lighter? It's us working together as one. And so lastly is, is we, need, we need the motivation for this. If we've been called to marvelous unity, if we've been called to a marvelous service, uh, then, then we need to know what is the motivation. And so I would say this on the last point. These people worked and were unified because they did it all for a marvelous city and for a marvelous king. And this Jerusalem is pointing to an ultimate Jerusalem. This is a different time in history. And so the people of God at this point were a nation state. And the nation needed walls for protection. They needed gates for protection. The city was a place that you could have a government. This needed to be established. So Nehemiah in, in, in this project isn't just pursuing some passion, but I believe deep within him as he's inspired and moved by the Holy Spirit, he knows that for prophecy to be fulfilled, certain things need to be in place. For Messiah to come, this was a necessity. We needed this city rebuilt. But interestingly enough, not far separated from him, Isaiah prophesies in Isaiah 26, 1. In that day, this song will be the song in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. He sets up salvation for its walls and bulwarks. So, so the walls are, are not physical walls anymore. They're walls of salvation. And so when Christ comes in on the scene, ready to fulfill all prophecy, he shows us that the temple was pointing to something greater than itself. It was pointing to him. He points to the city of Jerusalem and says, this city was pointing to something bigger than itself. It was pointing to the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, a spiritual kingdom that is not of this world. And so in Hebrews 13, 14, the writer says, for here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. And so what is that city like? What is the new Jerusalem like? What is the motivation for us? What's, what's to come? Because these people built this physical city. It's not there anymore the same way. And so for you and I, what are we waiting for? What are we expecting? We see a picture of this in Revelation 21, verses 2 through 4, where John says, And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, for he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So this Jerusalem to come, the new Jerusalem, is a better Jerusalem because God himself will dwell with his people forever his manifest glory before us, and the light of the Lamb will light the entire city. This is what is coming for us. Every tear wiped away. Every wrong made right once and for all. Every sin that remains finally rid from us, this earthly body done away with, and immortal immortality placed on us. Death shall be no more. I believe these people died looking to an ultimate city. 
and, and 2,500 years removed from us. And so I tried to think, I tried to get my head in the fact that these are real people with real lives, with real anxieties. Everything that we experienced, they did. They were ordinary people, broken people. And so are we. They had a daunting task, but they fulfilled it by the power of God. And so you and I can do the same with the Holy Spirit in us. And when I look at what's to come, I'm so excited. I took my wife. We went on a much-needed date night on Friday uh, and, and thank God she was willing to do this with me. I was like, I want to go to a cemetery. And, and so we did. It was a heck of a date night. Uh, but we're walking through this cemetery because I wanted to get in touch with the reality of death. It's coming. It's before us. And we're walking. We're having fun. We're looking at, at graves. And, and some people lived 80 years old. Some people lived 100 years old. And I'm making this connection. That's what these people, they lived lives. Their, their bones are somewhere. They were real. Some graves read three years of age. That's hard. <laughs> Look to this promise. Death shall be no more. No mourning, no crying, no pain. The former things have passed away. This former Jerusalem has passed away. This life is passing away. And so if we're only about building our own kingdom, it will pass away as well. Reminds me this week of a, of a poem by C.T. Studd. It's beautiful. He says, only one life, yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I know I'll say, twas worth it all. Only one life, twill soon to pass. Only what's done for Christ will last. What kind of kingdom are we building? And the beautiful thing that we see in the Gospels is that it's not necessarily what we do. It's who we're doing it for. And we can do all things to the glory of God. The new Jerusalem is huge. And we'll see this in Revelation come January. This is an appetizer, but it's 1,400 miles long recorded in John. Two and a half miles, 1,400 the city will be dazzling in every way. The light of God will be the light of the city. It has 12 gates representing the 12 patriarchs. It has 12 foundations, which are the apostles, which represents the gospel. Your takeaway this morning is that all of God's people are called to a marvelous unity and to marvelous service. We do this marvelous work because we have a marvelous king who is advancing his marvelous kingdom. Let's pray.